Hi, I'm Andy Simpson. I'm a technology learning coach with Fort Worth ISD Educational Technology, and I am here with Jennifer Laboon, and I'm going to allow her to introduce herself. I'm Jennifer Laboon, and I'm the coordinator of library technology here in Fort Worth ISD. I work down the hall from this guy, and I'm currently the president of the Texas Library Association. El Presidente de Librarian. <laughs> right. <laughs> Very impressive. Yes. That's why we have her here today. So, Laboon, can you tell me what's the last book you read or what are you currently reading from the library? I'm reading, actually, and by reading I mean listening to on my phone, in my car, at lunch, wherever I am, um, a, a, a really um, juicy Gossip Girl style book called The Thousandth Floor. Um, I had the opportunity of hearing the author speak at a um, TLA event that I attended in Houston a few weeks ago and she said that she wrote a book, um, wrote this book for teens who were looking at all of the current um, fiction that was out there and it was all post-apocalyptic, life was gloomy, Children were killing each other. It was, you know, fighting at the so, cornucopia. Right, <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. And she said, uh, you know, she wanted to create a future that was more positive and uplifting. And I mean, although not much different from the current reality that we have, just a lot more technology. So um, it's a great book and I'm almost about an hour away from finishing it. So um, I may be in, sitting in my car in the driveway for a little while when I get home to try to get to the end. I have, as you probably know, I have a great fear of elevators. Should I read this book or oh. not? Well, <laughs> they don't use the elevators because the thousandth floor, a thousand floors is like miles. So they use hovers to go up and down. It's very interesting. Oh. It's set in New York City and Central Park has become a massive tower that has become instead of uptown and downtown, it's up tower and down tower. Ah. And the tower has sort of taken over. Um, modern life so in New York it's very good mm -hmm. I it's it's if you like gossip girls type stories you would enjoy it but. I'm familiar with her work <laughs> <laughs> so so that that makes me think about a good segue here this we were talking about literacy mm -hmm. and you took you mentioned you're reading it by listening to it mm -hmm. um, this is this is uh, something I didn't prep you for but Okay. What, how do what do you consider literacy? I um, mean, because you obviously don't see it as just physically reading the book. So, what are ways that you can become literate, or what what are some examples of? Well, we know um, from format perspective that uh, it really doesn't matter the format so much as that kids or, or adults or anyone is engaging in text and in literature. So. Um, of course, literature being one type of literacy. There's literacy of all types, you know, how to use our technology, how to um, understand maps, and there's, you know, mathematical literacy. There's all sorts of literacy. Um, in fact, being an adult is almost another whole separate category of literacy that we're all still striving to achieve. But um, I have really become enamored with audiobooks as a way to be much more accessible for our kids and for our adults who feel like they don't have time to read anymore. And I um, was really sad. I'd gotten so busy that I, you know, find myself um, not getting to that stack of books that I'd hoped to get mm -hmm. to. And um, I discovered that, especially once I got a car that was uh, compatible with audiobook uh, options, it really just those short commute minutes add up and I can you know conquer about a book a week at this point which has been really nice because I my list had been really embarrassingly short um, of the books that I was was able to finish in a year so this year I'm uh, my goal was 50 and I'm getting close so I'm really wow, excited. That's impressive. Well some of them have been pretty long and so I'm adding a few shorter books to help with add my numbers as we get to the end so yeah. So that I mean you you kind of lead into my next question. Uh, something, my son was a really reluctant leader, mm -hmm. reader, sorry, until he was, um, until he was probably in fifth grade. And I really think it was him reaching a point where his maturity and his interests mm -hmm. intersected with, e with each other. What would you say to a parent or to a teacher who has that reluctant reader? What, what can they do to encourage them? Um, 
literacy was? Oh, I wish I had the answer. I have a 14 year old who falls into that category of striving reader. I mean, he is not, um, he's not a, a fully, um, he's not fully bought into novels and reading as um, a great way to spend his time. It's still homework for him. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and my husband's an English teacher. So between the two of us, we're like, we've got to help him, you know, cross that, that hump until he finds the things that are his things. And um, unfortunately right now he's at the school that doesn't have a school library. And it's, it's, it makes me very conflicted because obviously I, school libraries are extremely important to me, but he's at a, a very specialized fine arts charter school mm -hmm. and it was a sacrifice we had to make. And so I think in places where there are school librarians, there's that champion, that natural person there helping those kids find their genre, find the thing that, that makes them, um, that helps them discover that love of reading. And, and teachers, I mean, the, the teachers that are, the teachers and the librarians and the parents, the best things that we can do is model. And then um, talk about our books and spend time um, helping kids see the value of reading or listening or whatever the case may be as an alternative to YouTube on their phone because that is taking over their lives at this point. So. Yeah, it is. I would love, my son watches YouTube videos as much as I'll let him and he does learn a bit there, but yeah, yeah I would like absolutely. him to be expanding his learning, diversifying his portfolio, mm -hmm. if you will, of learning. Mm -hmm. Was there, you mentioned librarians, was there somebody in your life or a group of people in your life who really pushed you toward literacy and made you the reader that you are today? Um, I think both my parents really um, were there for me that made that happen for me. My mother um, was a stay-at-home mom and you know we constantly went to the public library and got another bundle of books to bring home and she would always read to us before nap time and I never would take a nap because I always wanted her just to read another book and she's like this isn't working <laughs> so um and I just was one of those kids that learned to read um, by sight words by listening to her read and watching the words on the page so I learned to read and entertain myself pretty early on um, but my dad even during elementary school he would spend time reading longer um, chapter books to me he read the hobbit to me when i was in fourth grade and i could easily have read it to myself but that time you know spent with him sharing um, one of his books that he was interested in reading um, was i think you know had a great impact on me and showed me the value of that uh, time reading a novel so um yeah i think that parents are probably the biggest role models in that regard doesn't always work out we're still working on it at our house so mm -hmm. yeah that, that's that modeling really sounds like like really the best way to get it going mm -hmm. I know for me it's always been a battle of I like to read on my Kindle mm -hmm. and I don't know mm -hmm. if it's a good thing for me to be reading on my Kindle or if it looks like I'm playing on it, or if I should be reading a physical book I think um, Oh, that's a hard one because we we read in the format that's you know most comfortable to us and as adults we're actually more um, we f um, we have a more strong affinity towards um, ebooks than our kids do they they want the print and as we're looking for ways to um, balance screen time for them having print books available is a great alternative to that screen time so I yeah I do think that um, as much as we can, you know, share print with them as an alternative to uh, ED and audiobooks is good, but um, don't tell them that audiobooks isn't, you know, as valuable because all the research shows that the comprehension that's gained through listening to an audiobook is just as good. The things that kids get out of um, being um, voracious readers, all the empathy and um, inferencing and all of the life skills, the soft skills that you can gain through a good book, um, you can get that just as well listening. And being a good listener is certainly a skill we want everyone right. yeah. to know. So, um, And so that kind of leads me to the next question. So we're talking about ebooks, and I know that that's kind of, that, that to me was the last big jump that I remember seeing with technology and literacy together. but. What, what do I not know about literacy? What's changing about it now? What, is there anything different about the way people are reading now? Or, or is there a trend to it? 
Well, I mean, I think we're still learning so much. I mean, we're very quick to making sure that we have the access to technology and our district has made a great commitment and done um, great things in terms of providing kids with online textbooks, one-to-one um, -one devices so that they're, you know, we're making sure the equity issues and, you know, is in place. Um, all, almost all of our um, reference material that you'd normally find in a school library is now online. Um, we are buying print still and heavily, but we're buying it in what would be more considered pleasure reading rather than um, reference or, um, you know, research material. Uh, it, it's much easier um, to maintain. It doesn't go out of date. Uh, you know, when it's online, it's quite easier to update and you're not spending a lot of money buying a bound set of encyclopedias, for example, that are hundreds of dollars that are outdated pretty much by the time they hit your shelf because the data changes so quickly. Um, so yeah, the the having that broad access is really important. And um, I think uh, as adults, we know that so much of our work has become learning um, things from the computer. Now, I will tell you that when I'm trying to solve a problem at work, whether it be how, what Excel formula do I need or how do I help a librarian who's you know having this problem or what happens when the keyboard changes on Chrome, you know, we Google it and a lot of times we're watching what? YouTube videos for how to fix these things. How do you fix your dryer? Well, you watch a YouTube video now and then if that doesn't work, then you call somebody. But, so our kids are learning that through YouTube and, um, I, you know, I think we, that helping them understand that there's value to what they're doing, but it all has to be in balance. Yeah, that's really that important. digital literacy and mm -hmm. like you coined earlier, adulting literacy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they got to build that adulting Lexile level. Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, but watching video, but also reading um, informational text online mm -hmm. is really important in our district is is doing that with their Achieve program, but um, it's gotta be balanced if you're trying to create lifelong learners and readers with um, a lot of pleasure reading opportunities mm -hmm. for our people. Um, I got, I have one last question okay. for you. Um, so um, I recently kind of reconnected with commonlit.org. I mm -hmm. think it's an amazing literacy resource. What's something you want to share with people out there? Something, a resource um, for literacy or just in general that you're fired up about right now? Well, I, d I mean, I don't have anything that's like new and the hot thing, so I'm not gonna share anything that's, you know, cutting edge necessarily, but it's becoming tried and true and that's Goodreads, you know, it's just a way to mm -hmm. track and get good um, recommendations for the next thing. There's a similar product that some of our schools have used called Biblionasium that's um, sort of appropriate for elementary that's um, Goodreads for kids, more or less, um, and it's free, or it was last time I checked. Um, but I'm a huge proponent, obviously, of Overdrive because mm -hmm. that's where I get most of my um, audiobooks. I have an Audible account, but that's expensive, and um, I can't keep myself up to, you know, current with my one book per month um, subscription, so I have to go to Overdrive um, through our public library or through our district. So um, Overdrive has two new apps out. One is called Sora, and that's the one that we're using in our district with our students. It's got badging and some other really cool things and some opportunities for teachers to engage with students. We haven't fully explored all the features. It's just coming online this fall, but um, hopefully we'll get some training on it um, in the next semester. But then Libby is their sister app that is the one that you use through um, the public library. So, And Fort Worth Public Library has great um, overdrive resources for Libby. The Houston um, Library has a digital subscription that is available to any member of the state of Texas, any Texas resident, and you don't have to mail anything in. You can sign up online and get um, access to their digital collection as well through Overdrive, so it's a great resource for us. Where would they go about finding that? We have some questions. Where would they go about finding the Houston information I to log in and create you accounts? Google Houston Digital Library Collection. It'll come right up. And it'll prompt you? Okay. 
and you just gave us a lot of cutting edge resources. Yeah, like you well, said there you, you did. Go. <laughs> Well, uh, this has been great. Thank you so yeah, much, Jennifer. For appreciate you me. today. I enjoyed and, it. And thank you so much, Web Chat Live. Thank you, Web Chat Live.